All right, and so we're here to talk about the cap K against planless and critical firmness. We're going to mainly focus on, in the time we have, we're going to focus on kind of uh, apps that focus on identity claims, whether they be uh, gender, sexuality, race, whatever. And so this elective is geared towards, you, you don't really have to have, we're kind of splitting the difference a little bit between if you've never thought about the CAPK or never gone for it or whatever, I think this lecture can get you up to speed. And then if you have gone for it and maybe it hasn't gone well, um, this will give you some new ways to think about it and some new tools. And so the first thing that you that I'd like to start with is how to conceptualize where your offense comes from and what your strategy is centered around. And there's two points. So there's two parts of a critical affirmative that you're trying to figure out and then that you're trying to disagree with. And um, there is the way that the AF diagnoses the problem it sets out, how, how it works, why it works, those kinds of questions. And you're going to say, you're going to offer a counter diagnosis, a different diagnosis than what the AF has said. And then the other one is their solution to the problem, whatever their mechanism for generating a positive outcome or generating change, we are going to critique that as well. So keep those two things in mind. Those are gonna be the two ways that we understand and compare the KF versus what we're saying. So it's good to take a step back and figure out what exactly the ultimate goal or the ultimate result of critical affirmatives and criticism in general is supposed to be. Why does it matter and what is it trying to achieve? And ultimately, this is a question that doesn't really come up in debate that much in these terms, but it's useful to think about, which is criticism is geared towards reshaping society and trying to make it better than what it was prior to criticism. And when we say better forms of society, I think we can generally agree that there are kind of two conditions that it would be really nice for society to have. And one is that people's basic necessities are provided for. We're talking food and healthcare and housing and things of that nature, water, et cetera. And then the second one, which is where a lot of criticism focuses on is a freedom from domination. People shouldn't be subjugated by other people. They should be relatively free to do what they want as long as they don't harm other people. They should be able to pursue their own ends, they should be able to develop their own sense of whatever subject or spirit or whatever you want to call it, and they shouldn't be coerced or restricted or imposed upon by outside people or forces. And so if you kind of survey literature or whatever, this is kind of how it works when you kind of come up with an idea of how society promotes happiness, justice, fairness. Those are the two kinds of ideas, freedom from domination and provision of basic necessities. And this is where we're going to start with why capitalism is problematic for these things. And then we are going to interrogate why chaos not only don't necessarily disrupt the capitalist dynamic, but potentially promote or serve its ends. So when we say that the problem is capitalism, and when we say capitalism, what we're talking about is how society organizes its production, how it organizes its production of resources into stuff. And so a mode of production, the method of producing the necessities of life, and there's two parts of, and when we say necessities of life, like we're talking about, we're talking about, you know, shelter, food, et cetera, transportation, infrastructure, the technologies that are necessary for these sorts of things. And there's two parts to a mode of production. There's the means of production, and the means of production is literally like the actual tools and technologies that are used for uh, the production. But then there's the relations to production, which is how people are, um, how, what, what people are juxtaposed against the means of production. Like we said, means of production, raw materials, resources, technologies, and the other key part is labor to create the stuff. And the relation of production is the distribution of the means of production. 
who for who possesses the means of production who possess how do you go about possessing the products that are the result of the means of production etc and so i think that there's going to be another slide that goes into so every society has a means of production, a remote of production, which has a means and a relationship production. There's all kinds of ways that you could organize society and have different modes of production. But capitalist modes of production are particular. We got a little, we got a little chat thing. Am I gonna, can we get the link to this PowerPoint? Mm, you can do that later. I will make this available later. Here's how capitalist relations of production work. You get, um, you get private property, which means that some people own the means of production and everyone else merely owns their labor. And that's how jobs work. You have your labor and then you sell it to someone who has the tools and the resources and the technologies to combine with your labor to produce stuff that people want. But you, when you go to a job, you generally don't own any of the th tools that you use when you are producing things. So given that labor is your only commodity, you sell it to meet your basic needs, you know, but the people who buy your labor are doing it to generate a surplus. Which means the capitalist society has two classes. There's those who own the means of production and those who are not. And this is something that is somewhat unique class society. Well, it's not necessarily unique to capitalist uh, modes of production, but it is intrinsic that there are, that capitalist modes of production generate a society that has classes, which are those who own the mean production who generally tend to be more powerful and those who do not own them and have less power. And then there's this pernicious thing that goes on when you, are selling your labor to meet your basic needs because the people who own the means of production are focusing on maximizing their profit, which means minimizing their costs and maximizing the productivity. And when the cost is your labor and paying you wages is a cost, then minimizing that puts in tension. If you're selling your labor to meet your basic needs, and they are minimizing their cost to pay as few wages as possible to maximize their profits, then there is a dynamic of scarcity where your ability to meet your basic needs through, through acquiring more wages is in tension with the ultimate goal of who you sell your labor to. Then there's a key part that you want to remember about this, which is if you sell your labor for less than what it's worth, which it's inherently the case that if you sell your labor for, there is no person, how am I gonna phrase it? A boss pays you a wage, but the boss pays you a wage for the purposes of making money. So there has to be a difference between how much money your labor is actually worth and how much your wage gets paid. If the numbers were the same, there would be no profit. If the numbers were inverted, if the wage was higher than what you, the number you produced, then the business would lose money. And so this idea that you produce more than you earn is the kind of inherent source of exploitation under capitalism. And this is one of the key ways capitalist society prevents people from being free from domination is because they are exploited for their surplus labor for the purposes of profit making, which is obviously not necessarily the most virtuous thing. And so that's the problem, is that people have to sell their labor to meet their basic needs, but they are exploited in that they do not get to recoup the full value of their labor. And there is this tension, this kind of more discrete micro minimizing of costs that uh, is kind of a imposition on workers that generates all kinds of ill effects that we are probably going to talk about a little bit later. But so the solution here is somewhat straightforward, which is if people had their basic provisions provided for and they had more autonomy where it wasn't, where they had more choice 
and more freedom and more latitude to do what they wanted, basically because they aren't forced into selling their labor to provide their basic necessities, that would generate more autonomy or give them more freedom to do whatever people wanted to do. But the issue is that employers are not going to give up this willingly. Employers, you know, businesses, they're in it to make money. So this is not going to happen naturally or straightforward. So the issue is that employers and people who own the means of production, they have the means of production and they use that to buy people's labor for less than what the labor is worth to generate profit. And they're not gonna change that basic thing up. They're not gonna just make it happen or they're not gonna reduce the profitability of their businesses to provide for basic provisions for everyone, right? So the key question to kind of resolve this capitalist dilemma is how do you extract it from employers and business or the whatever you want to call it, the bourgeois class or whatever. And so the method to achieve the solution is workers. And when I mean workers, I mean a collectivity or a collection of workers or workers as a class of people because they're the only agent that has a structural place within society that can stop, that can exert leverage over the power centers because without their labor, there is no profits. So if workers withheld their labor, businesses would not be able, they would cease to function. But the issue is a couple of workers doesn't really do much. You need a critical mass of workers who are organized and coordinated in such a way that it can serve as a he counter hegemonic entity. And for that, to get a critical mass of people who are organized and on the same page, you need class consciousness. In class consciousness, let's see if the slide explains it. Yeah, there we go. Awareness of oneself as part of a class. And the key part though is they have to internalize the idea that they're in an, an antagonistic relationship with the people who pay them wages and own the means of production. So first you have to recognize that you're in a class society and then you have to then further agree that the classes are not equal and that actually what is good for one class comes at the exploitation or the subjugation of another class. And like we said in the last slide, employers are not gonna go quietly into the night. You're not gonna be able to extract it. They're not gonna give it up willingly. They're going to use, they're going to resist. Generally people who have more power than other people, when you try to even the scales, they do not just happen naturally. They do not just do a smooth transition. You have to take it from them. And so for, if you need a critical mass of workers, but they have to be able to resist the pushback from trying to be a counter hegemonic force, then you need solidarity. Let's see if the slide explains what solidarity is. And so solidarity is the idea that you are not merely an individual or you're not merely, you know, that's kind of what it is. And solidarity is this idea that there is things beyond yourself, but not even beyond yourself, but that this, the sense that you are a contained, atomized individual it is less the case and that people are products and are always acted on by their communities and they are part of a bigger, you know, they are one part of a bigger collective or one part of a bigger whole. And solidarity is the idea that if there's an injury to one person in the community, then it's actually an injury to all, which means that you know, there's an equal force in response to injustices there, or yeah, it's kind of just, so everyone kind of treats, it's not, it is not, you know, all for one, one for all or whatever. It is this idea that what in, injury to one part of the collective is an injury to all of it. Ch -ch -ch -ch. 
And so let's circle back around to chaos now that we kind of have a clear idea of what the issue with capitalism is. And so the issue is you have to compare and contrast what we just outlined. We kind of outlined the issue with capitalism and how to solve it. And you have to figure out what critical AF ideas gum up the works of what we just said. It could be that they've diagnosed society incorrectly. It had, may be that they diagnosed that subcomponent of society is a bigger part, or they might have diagnosed society correctly, but then had a problematic or ineffective solution. Let's talk about debating the diagnosis part of this. You have to start this process very early in the debate. 1AC cross-ex, by getting them to describe what the crux of their affirmative is. This is actually one of the easier and more straightforward ways to do a cross-ex because the more they talk, the better it is for you. And you're allowed to ask open-ended questions because it is seldom the case that the 1AC, you know, these links are straightforward. You just need to tease them out a little bit more. And if they, you'll kind of figure it out. We just give a very particular solution with what is the problem with society. And if they give you answers that are not that, then you have the beginnings of a link argument. So if you look at that evidence packet we just sent, there's a 1EC at the top. I tried to find like a, little, a KF that was kind of more about criminal justice, but it didn't really work. Um, so this is kind of an old example that I have, but you can look in that evidence and you, I think the easiest thing might be to do is to control F a little bit, but you can be very, you can be very straightforward with these questions. Like that affirmative is about black women and then this idea of called textual crumping and like marinage and these other kinds of concepts. But it's kind of a F about black feminism and things like that. So you can ask, questions like what is blackness and the idea behind this question which yeah, I did not the idea behind this question is you just want to know what they're going to say and what you can start to begin to get clash we're going to tease out this identity link a little bit more but they're going to give you an answer where blackness has an essential character or is a fixed or static entity or has this core ontological character behind it where it's like blackness means this thing across time and space. And that's just what you want. You just want them to explain what their thing is, because then you're going to say why they're wrong a little bit later. This is kind of one of their cards, right? You can ask questions like this. And again, you want to get at this idea that they are diagnosing the problem in a different way. This is more like they're kind of giving like a patriarchal explanation for the thing that makes society particularly troubled, notions of civilization, things like that. And again, we're not talking about the specific class character of society in these explanations. These are why we're teasing out these questions, right? This is more of a mechanism question, right? What are we exactly are we talking about? But again, there's a lot of diagnosis questions. So and you know, I'll, what it's kind of unclear. A lot of people spend their cross X time against chaos, like setting up framework questions, like why vote F or what does voting neg mean or what should the neg say? And I just think that cross Xing about cap gaze is just a little bit better as far as ethos goes. And it's just, it's just a very low bar that you have to clear because you can just ask, what does all of this stuff mean? And the farther it gets from talking about class or capitalist production, then we can, we'll see in a second what the links are about. Um, yeah, this last question is about how does your mechanism work? What does it do? How do you think it resolves stuff? This is to get them to say, again, like what, our, what we said is we need kind of counter hegemonic structures based in workers, class consciousness, solidarity. So if they just like, are, are they, are, if they're just saying like this intellectual gesture or this thing we can do in debate or this rejection in our heads can solve stuff, then that obviously is a stark departure from what we're talking about with the cap K. Um, all right.
look at their evidence. Oh, last card in the 1AC apparently, let's see. Oh, and you can even see that a lot of KFs have, they tell you how they think about the diagnosis and the structure. And this idea, the blackness is contoured by the white grotesque readings of blackness. So this has placed what blackness means in the context of white psyche, white supremacy, white structural power, white, you know, the white mind, et cetera, which when we get into the Cap K cards, it, we're obviously gonna disagree with that. And we're gonna say that these forms of identity-based oppression come from capitalism. So we need to start dissecting what exactly is intention with these things. Because a lot of teams, you know, a very common answer is they list a long list of things. They say, race, gender, sexuality, but then one of the things they always list is class. And then one of the other things they do is they kind of always say, they say always already saying we said capitalism was bad, or they say capital hetero patriarchy or things of that nature. And the thing about treating class as an identity category, like the idea that like, oh, you're oppressed because you're a poor person, or you're oppressed, that's kind of the main one, this is just based on income. Like there's identity based off income like you're rich or you're poor, and that's how class society works. That's not really what we were talking about in terms of capitalist exploitation, right? There are tiers and there are gradients of how capital exploits people, but remember what our definition was, which is if you have to sell your labor to provide for your basic necessities and you don't get to recoup the entire value of your labor and you do not own the means of production, then you are being exploited. And we're going to talk about how we're going to talk about how that affirmatives usually focus on a specific subcomponent of that system of exploitation, um, while missing the larger picture. And that's kind of one of the big cruxes of this argument. So the first thing to note that maybe has never come up in your cap K debates is class is objective and empirical, which is different than a lot of other sorts of exploitation and oppression because you either own the mean of productions or you don't. And every capitalist society has been organized by class and private property and wage labor. And there, there's two classes, one class is more powerful and they exploit the other one. That's, you, that's how every capitalist society in all of time in every place on earth works. But other stuff, and this is in the context of race because a lot of our example when you see was in the context of black feminism, race is contingent and socially constructed. And what I mean by that is it means different things at different times to different people. And it doesn't structure the society to the extent that class does. And it doesn't have fixed meanings or implications across contexts. It can mean very different things in different places. And sometimes racialization doesn't even result in something being bad, just it being different. But capitalism invariably leads to class, which invariably leads to exploitation. So that's kind of the first thing is, like we said, if they have kind of, if they just say blackness is this white grotesque reading, the white mind grotesque reading or whatever, that's a more, that's not a very particularly socially or contingent constructed, that, do, that effaces all the different ways that you could talk about blackness and it masks them and it, says that they don't really exist and they, it overdetermines or simplifies it down to blackness is this antagonistic thing with blackness is this, mm, yeah, it's like antagonistic with white, uh, the white mind, white subjectivity, white psyche or whatever. And this is one of the beginning parts. Uh, and then the other thing they might do, like I said, I don't think any of the cards in the 1AC do this, but if they kind of treat class as an identity, which is really it's less an identity and it's more a structural kind of position in society that's objective and empirical. And there's more. There's a difference between exploitation and oppression. Capitalism exploits people, we've been going over that. Oppression I would define as the discrimination, violence, and other negative effects 
suffer by a particular group. And it's usually on the basis of an ascriptive difference, i.e. A, di a thing that you can see that is part of like who they are, part of their body, part of, you know, that's what ascriptive difference is. Gender, race, ethnicity, sexual identity, religion, some other factor. And oppression is when people are discriminated, violence, less harder to get their basic needs met, less power in society based on those differences. And so oppression is, I think this other card is gonna talk about it. So the she evidence, which you have a copy of that you can read along with if you want, describes how this difference between exploitation and oppression works. And it says that oppression is systematized to aid exploitation by mystifying the relations to production. And it says identity politics locates the oppression of different identities with individuals who are part of the normative identity. And it goes on to explain what that means. It says, thus the source of oppression of trans people is cis people, of black people, white people, non-binary people, binary people, and so on. Since what matters in this view of the world is subjective experience rather than material reality, the oppression perpetrated by individual cis white or binary people is whatever is experienced by the trans, black, or non-binary non people being oppressed. And I think there's one more line on the slide, yep. And so the reason why that part, that theorizing is problematic, one of the reasons that she evidence gives is because it says clearly the only way you can fight the oppression are the oppressed people themselves. Involving other people would be to bring those who at least do not understand the experience and are at worst are oppressors themselves. So the issue with saying that the source of oppression is from your normative identity is because that, again, mystifies or effaces what is generating the ability to create that oppression, which is the fact that some people have more power because they own the means of production, which are the things that create the basic necessities of life. Some people own them, other people don't, and that is a, that is a recipe for people becoming exploited. And so if you explain oppression in a different way, it kind of lets that explanation off the hook and it doesn't bother anybody and they don't think about it. And the other part that happens is your solution is not gonna work because your solution is targeting normative identities and those people when in reality, what you need is to rearrange how society provides for the basic needs of people and generates autonomy for others. And the reason why this last she evidence that would be a problem is because remember what we need, we need a critical mass of workers. But if it's some people, if only the oppressed can fight their oppression and normative identities are inherently the ones producing the oppression, that makes it a little bit tougher to generate that critical mass of worker solidarity. It also doesn't generate any class consciousness, which is one of the things we said we needed. So like we talked about, if you abstract race, i.e. you give it an essence or a metaphysical dimension, or you say it works this way in all these different scenarios and all these different times and places and it works the same way, this is a very common definition. This will come up a lot on this topic. When you say that blackness, when you take the American experience from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, and then you come up with a re you then you come up with an essence or a metaphysical part of blackness based off that that you kind of ontologize blackness, which is not to say that that original description is incorrect in any way, or that the violence done on white versus black lines is not it's, it's not to say it's incorrect or any of those things, but it's rather to say that it misdiagnoses, like the Shiavan said, what is actually causing or driving the society, right? It creates false consciousness that you're making progress on something when you aren't. It's a palliative effect. Like white people focusing on reading anti-racist books and generating and making sure that in their heads they don't have any animus or animosity or they have any problematic thoughts for other uh, ethnicities and other races. And then that's better, that's what they do, right? So if someone could own a business and pay somebody less like a, like inhumane wages or whatever, 
like Kylie Jenner produces all her crap in like Bangladesh and doesn't pay, and she's like worth a billion dollars. She doesn't pay any wages or whatever. But like as long as she says Black Lives Matters and like reads a book and doesn't think anything bad about anybody, then it's like, oh yeah, she keeps she's obviously not racist. She doesn't do any overtly racist stuff. But that doesn't make society any more just. It doesn't make it any less problematic, right? And like we're gonna talk about if racialization is a subset of capital and the way capitalism sustains itself, thinking that you can make it more radical or you just need to like invert binaries and things of that nature doesn't mean that you're gonna be very good at challenging capitalist domination. Oh, here we go, we got, we got another quote. It says, since oppression is not a separate phenomenon from exploitation, but a support for the exploitative system, it's surely impossible to regard the results of reification as a route out of oppression. If you're in chains, declaring that they are kinky and empowering is unlikely to set you free, which just means that you can't focus on a subset of oppression. You have to focus on the totality of the system as it exploits and oppresses people at the same time. And I think there might be more, oh, there's more. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a link that is very particular. This is uh, pretty strategic for debate purposes because a lot of chaos are like, oh yeah, we can do this thing in this round. All we gotta do is do this personally. You know, chaos are very uh, centered on like the agency to a certain extent of what the debaters can do or what given intellectuals or activists can do as people. And so this individualization is a kind of low-hanging fruit to say that they are a neoliberal logic. This, uh, you know, your focus is not generating, because, you know, what we described as the alternative, you know, a counter-hegemonic force, organized solidarity, class consciousness of a bunch of people all at once that are way different, but they all have a commonality in being a worker. It doesn't, you know, debate doesn't really, for whatever reason, it's one of the dumb parts of debate. It's like warming good. It's so like that kind of conversation about how to organize that kind of force doesn't really just come up in debates. Ah, another quote. And this is why the starting point matters. This is why you can't just be like, oh yeah, we can agree with like what the class thing you said was and then we can just do our thing too because we're not like wrong about how blackness works 100%. And so there's a discursive focus on the multiple differences between groups, but this framing does not demand an analysis of systems of exclusion beyond their naming. Thus the tendency is toward locating identity in purely cultural terms, flattening out the different functions of race, class, and gender, so they all appear as static, timeless descriptors of identity, rather than as dynamic categories which are active, actively shaped by oppression and the needs of capital. Without this, identity and oppression can only appear as interpersonal discrimination. If there's no explanatory schema for why racism and sexism serve particular functions, they can only be patho pathologized as undesirable traits. And this kind of quote and this kind of section is very apt for what critical ass are talking about when they talk about identity. And it was even evident in our black feminism example, again, that line that says blackness is a white grotesque reading of the mind or whatever, then the issue there is that racialization and oppression exist for a reason. They do not exist as a timeless, and well, they are a product of a antagonism, a very particular antagonism that is contingent and historically founded, which is the capitalist society. But there is not this fixed metaphysical antagonism between different races. Racialization is a process that can be changed, it can be undone, it can mean different things. But if you do not have an explanatory schema for why markers of blackness are oppressed, then your only explanation is that these things are just pathologized by society for whatever, for some reason, or maybe you won't even give a reason. They're just, you know, inherently pathologized, which doesn't, again, causes this masking mis mystification effect that we're trying to avoid. So a very common thing that people will get accused of, and this might be because of your explanation, it's like when you say root cause or you reduce things to class, they're gonna call you reductionist. And they're gonna say, class can't explain everything. For instance, LeBron James went into a store, or no, LeBron, the LeBron James example is his house got vandalized and he's a rich guy. So like, obviously, you know, 
class. He's part of pretty. He's part of the bougie class, and yet he still suffered an act of racism. And the issue there is again, we because that kind of conflates class with an identity, which is LeBron James is just kind of more of a worker because he's still. LeBron James gets paid a lot of money, but he still generates like billions of dollars worth of value and he doesn't recoup all the costs. So I would say he's more of a worker. He's on the higher tier of worker and he doesn't have to suffer any of the kind of tension about getting your basic necessities provided, but still exploited under, so that's kind of complaining class with an identity category. And there are other things you can say about this as well, which is, again, we're not really dispute, disputing any contingent historical fact is not really what's up. Like Jim Crow being bad, Jim Crow being because white people were antagonistic towards black people. Totally, totally generally true. But again, the focus, the only focus we're on is the overall diagnosis of the problem and whether the, their, their diagnosis mystifies certain problematic things, i.e. class society, and their solution, whether their solution is more in line with capital or actually disrupts capital. And we've said what can disrupt capital is a counter hegemonic force. So if your thing is not very good, at a counter hegemonic force, and it actually, then you're not going to be very good at challenging capital. Capitalism will accommodate you; it'll co-opt your shit. And then, if you're the re the reasons you give make it harder to un to produce class consciousness or solidarity or understand capitalism, then you've done worse. You've made it. It would have been better just to do nothing. Mm, yeah, like I said. Their prioritization is bad if you win an argument on mystification, but it just depends, and this kind of depends on a little bit of the specifics. If you look at that re-19 card I think I put in that doc, this is what I mean when I say class is more explanatory power. It goes through instances about what drives a problem and it explains why it's class, and then it also goes further and it offers up examples of when there were kind of an anti-racist first solution to those problems and how it didn't work. I think his examples are about like New Orleans and um, the gutting of like public services in New Orleans or Teach for America or gentrification in, I don't know if he actually lists a city, it might be Chicago or it might have just been gentrification generally. And you aren't saying that suffering as a worker is worse than oppression suffered as a black person or a woman or a trans person or any of those things. But you're saying that capitalist society is worse. It's bigger, it causes the oppression, it also causes other things like environmental harm and extinction and things like that. So it implicates more people, it does worse stuff, it facilitates racism, and it plunders the planet. So capitalism is just bigger. It's, this is a common K trick, which was well, just a common K argument, which is, you know, you talk second, you're kind of talking about a bigger ideology or a bigger thing than the F, and that's how you generate your, your external impact. And the cap K against KS is no different. A little bit more about this neoliberal solutions thing, which is kind of the neoliberalizing forms of resistance and education and all these things is that they take particular forms. It's individual, it's individuals overcoming or resisting. It's thinking everything is political. It's speaking or performing a non-normative position and assuming that disrupts or resists normative positions which is more radical or progressive or insightful. And the classic example of this is kind of just like the radical position of like black women in this AF context. It's like black women have this, you know, they suffer through multiple intersections of oppression and they are, their insights are more radical. It's just generally like white, white dudes should take step aside and we should center kind of black women because of their insights, their unique insights and all of these things. And they have kind of this most radical potential. And I don't know if I put this, but obviously, you know, Condoleezza Rice, for an example, is a black woman who I would say doesn't have any particular radical insights. I would say she's pretty neoconservative. So this is again, kind of just the essentializing of difference that can be problematic. Um, and everything that everyone does, even if they are from a particular position doesn't necessarily mean that they, what they do is automatically radical. Like Herman Cain is a black guy. He's not particularly radical. 
<clears throat> and this idea is again, you want neoliberalism is all about anti-collectivity. So it's all about thinking that there's some kind of a central difference between people. There's something that puts us antagonistically or in competition with one another, which is a problem. Um, neoliberalism just theorizes that that's how society works. Society is just a bunch of individuals that are, there are no things that connect us. There are no bonds of solidarity. It's just, we all are out here and we're all just trying to do our own thing and we're trying to maximize our self-interest or try to maximize our profits or whatever or maximize our social capital. Again, it can be what, what, we're, what the target is, doesn't really matter, neoliberalism doesn't really care, as long as you're hustling for something. And then there is a difference between us. There's like, there's some essential difference, right? And it could be any kind of thing. Again, neoliberalism just wants you to think that people are different from one another, and that makes it so you have to compete rather than share or be in a community with one another. And so solutions that are overly individualized or are premised on having essential differences with people is an issue. It is in line with neoliberal reasoning. I have a car that I didn't give you, but this is a car that gives an example. The imagery of the individual overcoming odds to achieve recognition maps onto the fantasy of limitless upward mobility and persistent individuals who persevere and remain true to their dreams. As such, it's neoliberalism's version of social justice combined with a rhetoric of difference that reifies as autonomous cultures, in effect, racializes what are actually contingent modes of life reproduced by structural inequalities as fantasy crowds inequality as a metric of injustice out of the picture entirely. Like we said, bad for solidarity because if People are antagonistic because they, some people have normative identities and some people have anti-normative identities. That's pretty hard. Ooh. And yeah, we talked about, it's also bad for alternative formulations because you're taking a subset of the capitalist system of oppression and then you're just like trying to make it radical. You're just like, oh, we just need to reach it. If blackness was created to make people think that they were different, to particularly subjugate people, to lower their ability to challenge capital society and class society, then saying that we just need to affirm blackness or we need to treat blackness as an entirely radical entity probably doesn't achieve the difference of shaping class society because you can do that without again you can affirm blackness but affirming blackness doesn't mean you rearrange who owns the means of production or where people's basic necessities or the capitalist exploitation at the heart of the system uh at profit making and things like that so that's what I mean, the she quote about identity previously. So that's like kind of one example. And there are uh, other, other pieces of evidence kind of get into this, but I, I was gonna like go through some of those other cards, but it was again, just kind of me reading and then explaining it. So we can, I can open this up to questions if anyone has them for the last few minutes that we have. If people have those, mm, no. Um, I had a question about like how you're explaining like um, like class. You're saying like some people will say like you're reductionist. Like what what was that talking about? I didn't really get that. So they're gonna say that there are things that exist independent of class. Like you could be rich and still experience racism or sexism or whatever. It's just like getting rid of class does not like if there was no class that wouldn't stop people from being racist right so that's why it's like a reductive uh a reduct that's what they're that's what the accusation is going to be but the issue is that again presumes that there's some kind of fundamental antagonism between different races of people and it effaces why ideas around racialization, i.e. it's like, I'm white and some other people are black and thus that makes me automatically better. Like how society ingrains those ideas in people are for a particular purpose. And if you get rid of the foundation for why those things happen, and if you struggle, it's kind of this counter hegemonic thing where you agree that you have stuff in common with other people and you agree that you have a source of yeah, you have something in common with each other, that process of struggling will kind of undo those problematic ideas of difference. 
And so it's mostly that not nah, like their argument that like racism can exist. It's like, obviously it could. I would probably say racism is more of a structural kind of thing to kind of discriminate and disproportionately share power. And I would say that their examples are more about bigotry. Like some person is just like, I hate you because you're different. It's not really, right? Um, and so, yeah, if you get rid of, if like there is no capitalist society, I don't think it's easy to say that like your, the notions of racism under capitalist society will just carry over. And also there's reasonable evidences that say the process of struggling would also resolve that issue. How would capitalism explain ontology arguments like gratuitous violence, the Bill Malcolm, et cetera? They would say that those things are not really ontological, that they're socially contingent and they are for a particular purpose, which is, again, the reproduction of class society. Violence is generally not gratuitous. Gratuitous means that like it happens for no reason. Um, and it does happen for reasons. It happens because class society again. In libidinal economy, I would say uh, that most people would just say that the, your relations to production in, inform the libidinal economy, but you could also just say the libidinal economy is stupid. Um, but libidinal economy doesn't exist independent of class society, like what you, so that would be my answer to that. What do you think the most persuasive answer to the perm is? Well, I would say it's generally link arguments, which we've been going over, which is you cannot forward a particular explanation that mystifies capitalism and then expect to, again, if the alternative is to propagate ideas and analyze and come up with solutions and means of action and also understands of the problem that generate class consciousness and solidarity, you cannot propagate all of these um, problematic, if you can't diagnose the problem wrong, because of the mystification style link arguments, and you can't really forward solutions that overly individualize or reproduce kind of neoliberal social justice. So again, it's all about focusing on those two points of clash, and those are just, it makes the perm self-evidently kind of bad. How specific should you be about describing what the world of the alternative looked like? Uh, I would be only as specific as necessary. I would say, you know, the alternative, is, I don't know, let me look. Uh, but no, yeah, definitely only, but you can get, you wanna start, you know, I wouldn't, don't be unnecessary, don't get to, don't be voluntarily, you know, forward about that. I'm trying to find where this file is, but I can't find it. But you can obviously get more specific. There's lots of things that fit into the alternative that clash with the F. Like if the F has said the government is bad, you know, like socialist organizing, socialist movements around particular things that radically, you know, reduce the profit motive and kind of increase people's ability to antagonize class and whatnot are all good things. Like if you all, if you just said like that alternative is a movement to try to enact single payer, that was like our alternative on a healthcare topic. That was pretty straightforward and easy. And like, no one was like, oh, but single payer is bad. Just like the KF can't like say stuff like, like the radical stuff that you say, they can't really say it's bad because they're technically in line with it. I so what the alternative is a politics of organizing around the common experience of life shaped by political economy. Yeah, so it's just like, you're, you're creating a politics. You're creating a politics so that it generates class consciousness and solidarity and stuff. And when you say you're creating a politics, that means you know, it's all about your ideas and like what you think is true and like how you diagnose problems and like what your solution to them is. So it makes it very easy. Any other questions? Any other questions? Good questions. Good questions. All right. Dope. Um, then yeah. Next thing is at one, I believe. We'll lab at one or whatever's going on in your labs. I think, is that right? Yep. If there are no more questions, you all are good. See you around. Thank you. Yeah.